Good afternoon, my colleagues. I, I, in the, uh, the outset, I would like to thank um, uh, KV, Vijay, and the Cornell University for having given me this opportunity to uh, give a presentation. Uh, and I would also like to thank the Rockefeller Foundation because uh, no, it, it is only Rockefeller training. I was trained in uh, rice transformation in um, maybe around 1996, and I, I was trained in the Scripps Research Institute under Rock, Dr. Roger Beachy. And then, uh, no, I went back to the university. When I went back to the university, Rockefeller gave me that money, 120,000 US dollars. I was asked to establish a lab. And since that date up till today, I could uh, produce up till. Uh, it, it is more a kind of human resource because we did not, I, I'm basically a, a professor of plant pathology. My university wanted uh, to establish a rice transformation laboratory because in those days, a learning kind of agrobacterium mediated rice transformation has got more to do with plant pathology. So I was uh, the, deputed by the university to go first to go to University of California Davis I worked under Dr. Bill Lucas who is the who calls himself the slave of plasmidis matter mm -hmm. so I worked under him then I went to uh, Roger Beach's lab in Scripps Research Institute then to as a Rockefeller visiting fellow in the John Ennis Center under Paul Christo so this is basically this is the in short my background so uh, from rice transformation we switched it to um, uh, uh, after no, after ABSP two uh, uh, yeah, came out. No, I I got into this project. I was the PI, and I'm going to give you some idea about what is going on in my country. About uh, uh, <coughs> okay, so India is still it's home for the largest number of hungry people anywhere in the world, uh, but. I'm very sure that with the advancement of science and technology, India can exploit the potential to feed its poor and to improve the socioeconomic status. And the, uh, before going into the best example that is BT cotton in India, the success, it was a thumping success. Before going into that though, I would like to give you some idea about the Indian agriculture, what is strange in that, you know, the value of inputs uh, in agriculture, Indian agriculture is more than the value of the farmland. That means it is intensive. Intensive for agriculture is the rule. You can you can escape that. So the predominantly small farm holdings, maybe quarter an acre, half an acre, or one acre, or th these are these are the size. Uh, no, it is not like you cannot compare that holdings with American holdings, which are very very uh, uh, big in size. And the another important thing is inheritance to offspring. If I have 10 acres of land, if I have uh, five sons, not to mention the daughters, you know, because Indians never inherit, you know, traditionally we don't inherit to daughters. Okay, I have, if I have five sons, now I give two acres each to each sons, and uh, the two acre is not going to be a single block of land, you know, it's going to be kind of scattered half an acre in one place, 0.5 acre in another place, 0.25 acres in another. So it's going to be a kind of scatter. So it's a small holding, okay? So, <clears throat> so intensive agriculture holds the key. And in 2006, the Indian farmers who took the biotech crop, there was only one variety so far. No, still there is only one variety, one crop which was introduced to India, that is BT cotton. In 2006, approximately 2.3 million resource poor farmers benefited from biotech crops. It uh, no high adoption, adoption rate was the uh, kind of um, uh, thing that you need to look into. And 95 percent of Indian area under cotton is now covered by an American technology, only single gene, maybe uh, two genes. No, Cryonacy was the first one to be introduced. And the gene was, uh, no, the, the technology was Monsanto's, but it was uh, executed by Maiko, uh, Maiko Research. And I would like to give you some idea about what is in the pipeline as far as India is concerned. You just look into that GM India Incorporated. There are at least 41 food crops that have government approval for GM trials. And there are the, almost all the states excepting Rajasthan and the, the, the East, you know, Bangla, uh, West Bengal, they are not working. Chhattisgarh has declared itself as a kind of GM free state. They don't work on that. And most of the <coughs> Tamil Nadu comes over here. This is Tamil Nadu. This is the, we work on several other crops. Where where do I where I belong to? Okay, then 
Um, again, uh, I like to go back to BT cotton. Why um, uh, India is very important. India has got the largest area under cotton at global scale, no global level. We have about nine million hectares under, and about nine million hectares. Ninety-five percent of the cotton area has been covered by a single technology, and uh, it is BT cotton technology. Right. So before that, you know, we have been using. Um, the pesticides, and you just look at the map. You know how what is the intensity of um, you know, is the maximum. <clears throat> the people who are there in the in uh, Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, and then uh, Maharashtra, they have been using a lot of pesticides before the advent of Bedikaran. I just wanted to give you some picture about that. And as far as uh, BT cotton is concerned, no, I just wanted to give you another example. No yield increase. By year, in the case of at least three crops, one is wheat, the other one is corn, the other one is soybean. Now, in these three crops, it was you no, know, it 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 took about 140 years yeah, uh, to improve the yield, right? So, from 1860 onwards to 2000, 2000, it was a span of 140 years for. And um, for the yield, yield to be increased in these crops. But in the case of BT cotton, it was I can't say yield enhancement because no, it is again politicized. So I want to I want to be very careful about yield enhancement because this technology is not to, is intended not to increase the yield but to, to reduce the loss in yield caused by a single major pest called bollworm complex. So if you want, if you say if I say that you know the, the technology BT technology has increased the yield, that is wrong. It has uh, reduced the yield loss. That is, but the yield enhancement was about 40 percent. So within just a few crops after the introduction of BT cotton, the you know, India originally it was a kind of importing cotton uh, for its own internal needs, but after the advent of advent of BT cotton in India. India became a kind of cotton exporter, so that is reality. So now I go back, go to BT uh, eggplant, eggplant uh, no, fruit borer damage. This, this, is a, this is the single major pest, and it is this particular pest is a monophagous pest. It doesn't uh, feed on any other thing than eggplant. Okay, and this is the fruit borer damage as identified by the consumer. If you go to the market you no know, uh, for vegetable market and you buy you you take any fruit you know you just cut it open and you are bound to see a few uh, worms in that okay so <clears throat> very serious problem okay so the marketable yield is uh, reduced maybe up to 70 percent maybe in the, in the worst case it is going to be up to 70 percent and I would like to give you you know it's a kind of cartoon it the cartoon was made by my son when he was doing his eighth grade now he is in the university, and he he helped me make this cartoon. The credit goes to him, and I would like to give you some idea about how the farmer uh, is facing the problem. You know the the problem fruit and shoot borer problem in uh, eggplant cultivation. <coughs> so he has to the farmer has to be kind of entomologist or a biologist or a zoologist to understand the whole problem of uh, the fruit and shoot borer. And he has to know what is the life history of the pest. The pest, it's called Leucinodus arbonalis, and it's the adult moth, the eggs, single eggs, most of the times it is single egg, and within three days, the eggs hatch into neonate larvae, and the neonate, la neonate larvae, the, the just, just born larvae, they have to find the feed within two to three hours, otherwise they are going to die of starvation or they are going to be picked up by the birds or they are going to be inactivated by the UV radiation. So they have to find a yeah, 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 feed within two to three hours immediately after its birth. And they have to, uh, they, they go in search of the developing fruits or the shoots and within two to three hours they have to get into. Once the worm gets into the uh, fruit, there is no insecticide on earth which can penetrate the fruits. No matter how much you are going to spray, how many sprays you are going to take, the the pesticides are not going to get into the fruit, and uh, the uh, worm comes out of the uh, uh, fruit, develop, no, fruit developing fruit within nine to fourteen days, and and it sometimes it pupates 
uh, on the fruit itself, most of the times it's on the soil, into, in the soil, and in seven to nine days, uh, the adult emerges and the life cycle goes on. So the farmer should know what is the uh, weakest link in this life cycle so that he can tackle that pest at the right moment to achieve the best control. And the farmer is left with uh, the two to three hours window. The window is very, very small and he has to direct all his sprays within that particular two to three hours. Just imagine this: if this is going to be the case of a single egg and if there are going to be several broods, okay, so he, he, he needs to keep um, uh, spraying all the time. Maybe some, some of the Coimbatore farmers where I hail from, they end up with 60 sprays in a crop duration of 180 days. So <clears throat> this is the Achilles heel, the weakest link in the life history. So uh, he has to direct all his uh, uh, pesticide sprays here. So the farmer's dilemma is to go in for the repeated pesticide sprays, which is as many as 60, or to go in for the BT technology, which is going to take care of the crop 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So the problem is very simple. <clears throat> now I used to go give this lecture to several um, schools, colleges, and some of them are Christian missions. Uh, the co colleges run by Christian mission. I used to uh, use this example to impress upon them. So who is your Goliath? Okay, it's David and Goliath. And as far as the eggplant farmers are concerned, the Goliath is this one. The invincible Goliath is the fruit and shoot borer. The Coimbatore farmers now use as many as 60 farmers to control this pest in a crop duration of 80 days. So just, <clears throat> so David uses a sling to kill that monster. So what is that sling? No, that sling in our farmers, BT, Brinjal farmers case is the, the sling is nothing but the gene which has been sourced from the humble soil bacterium. Bacillus thuringiensis. So this is this, this cartoon I used to impress upon the audience. So I just wanted to let you know about this. So in fact, a BT eggplant is uh, organic too. That's what because you no, know, in my when I did my undergraduate during those days, 1970s, my teacher used to tell me that this is the thuricide, the whole cell, the bacterial cell which needs to be sprayed onto brinjal or eggplant, and in order for achieving a good control of so the problem with this uh, thuricide is that it's a living organism and it needs to be uh, sp uh, sprayed at the right place at the right time and it, you know, it is liable to be inactivated by the sun. So it needs to be, it is going to be washed away by the rains. So all these problems are avoided in Bt cotton. So Bt, cotton, Bt eggplant is the better version of this. So as far as the, the TNAU of my university Bt eggplant program, we chose uh, uh, four varieties, four open pollinated varieties, and uh, Kotu is preferred in the Coimbatore region where I hail from. The Madurai one is the regional, no, there are other Madurai one, Kiliculum KKM1, and the PLR1. They are the regionally uh, preferred varieties. <coughs> and basically, the seeds were, you know, I sent my seeds to Mahiko. They, uh, they had the, uh, the original parent which has been transformed with the BT gene. They, they made a F1 of that and the F1 seeds were transferred to me. For, you know, I used my own variety as the recurrent parent and I got that. I just back crossed that. <coughs> so these are the few milestones. You know, I, I, because we don't have much time, I skip this. So we were asked to, we applied for a kind of uh, permit uh, to conduct the um, uh, MLRT, that means multi-location research trials, and we were given permits by the government of India to conduct at least two multi-location trials. One, the first trial was conducted in a city which is 300 miles away from my city, and it is called Madurai, and we, we conducted that um, MLRT there. And the, the fruit and shoot borer incidence was observed, and there was no incidence of other pests which are supposed to be uh, occurring together at that particular time. The percentage damage to shoots and fruits was significantly lower for the BT lines when compared to the non-BT counterparts. And you can just see this you now, because this is the white background, you can see the, uh, 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 the uh, I'm going to so show you other. This is the best uh, uh, example I can show you. This is the worst case in CO2, non-BT, and this is the BT. You can just see uh, 
uh, a curvature here that is that is the place where you know the the neonate larvae tried to uh, enter into but it was not possible but there it left a kind of scar or a curvature so it attempted its <coughs> Then, as far as uh, fruit, you know, we always, uh, you know, in the case of uh, eggplant, we always calculate in terms of the percent marketable fruit yield. What is the percent marketable fruit yield in the case of BT versions, and what is that in the case of non-BT counterparts? And okay, so we also worked out the economics of BT eggplant. So, in the case of the the first one, if you are going to put one rupee as the input and you are going to get back 4.47 rupee as the returns. So, <clears throat> and we are also supposed to um, monitor the non-target pest. You know, the target pest is that fruit and shoot borer. What is the, what happens to the non-target pest and or the beneficial insect? So, there was no significant difference and what's even. <clears throat> as far as the pesticide sprays, uh, between the BT uh, eggplant and the non-BT eggplant, we, we had to take up some 12 sprays um, for the non-BT uh, plots, and in the case of BT plots, it is only two sprays, and that two, those two sprays were directed against the non-target non insects. They are mostly sucking pests. And as far as regulatory processes in the release of BT eggplant, we have this is as as required by law, Indian. Uh, regulatory system is somewhat more stringent and it required all these things uh, all these things to be you know we obtained the last step step is this GEAC genetic engineering appraisal committee approval we got that but the the, uh, the this is the topmost scientific body GEAC genetic engineering Appro appraisal committee and it gave its approval but the minister um, uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh put a hold uh, put imposed a moratorium on that uh, so this is just a way of saying by through cartoon so what is the the same thing the rcgm gec mec all these things and the union ministry of agriculture so it is the cartoonist the, the, the some magazines produce this <coughs> okay what is the present status i have 25 grams in each of the four um, bt versions of the open pollinated varieties of eggplant, 25 grams. Okay, I'm. I, no, this is the product. This is the end results of my 10 years of work. 25. I'm supposed to give it to the government of uh, deposit with the government of India, and they are supposed to take care of that. So uh, we we have yet to give the uh, send the seeds to those people. So uh, that uh, the, my 10 years of efforts. You no, know, it's in the form of 25 grams of the BT eggplant seeds. Okay. So uh, now I would like to give you some idea about, uh, there are several papers about the perception and the risks and benefits of BT eggplant by Indian farmers. The, this is a paper from Singapore University. And there are several other papers, even Deepthi um, published, Deepthi Kaladi, she published a few papers. You know, just the, you know, uh, the public awareness is good, but I would like to give you some uh, feel of that uh, you now the kind of public awareness which is very much available very much uh, present in India is this you now uh, we need to the pro we have the problem of irresponsible reporting and the most of the um, uh, the, the uh, popular media they do the, those people who are uh, either mischievous or they are uh, not educated well on the subject you know I would like to give you one example that I would read it out the health risks from inhaling the BT gene have also come to light. So, this was published in a magazine, in a, in a, in a newspaper, and whatever, if it is going to appear in the, the Hindu, the newspaper, and that is kind of perceived as a kind of biblical truth, true, nothing but true, kind of. So, if it is going to be published in a paper like Hindu Business Line, and the people, public, you know, they always think that it is true. Nothing but true. So media's anti-technology anti stance certainly sells in India. Indeed, it's a cash cow. So they make a lot of money. So they just, just Tegelka is kind of a yeah, kind of sting magazine. No, they, uh, so it, 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 it uh, runs a story like this. India story, grow back now. So from cities, you go back to the kind of, 
So it's a, indeed a cash cow. <coughs> so it pays to be an activist. So just compare what Bala got from um, Cornell University or Government of India put together, all these put together, so much money. Uh, just compare this with the money one single activist got in India. Just compare this money. So if you are, no, we, we used to call it a kind of denial industry. The denial industry gets more than those who develop the technology. <laughs> okay, uh, no, there is, there. There was one back. One yeah, yeah, I saw. Okay, uh, I just wanted to reproduce whatever Steve Jones has written in his language of genes. Uh, charlatans who have a political ax to grind. Part of this reticence was due to ignorance, but part came from the dismal history of the subject. He refers to uh, the studies of human inheritance, you know. Now, it is same, same is true of GM crops in India also. So, so organized resistance to BT plant, you know. Uh, there were um, demonstrators, opponents, you know, who placed these kind of placards. TNAE is sold to Monsanto. So because TNAU is part of this BT plant project, uh, they, they assumed that the TNAU has been, my university has been sold to Monsanto. So for the politics, in fact, this describes well. You know, instead of cutting the bridge, I'll know uh, we cut our fingers. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few scientists, scientists, they never open, the, open their mouth. They never open their mouth. A very few scientists, uh, because of some kind of repercussions or uh, kind of, we never open our mouth. And one, this is one of the examples, you know, where the BT eggplant is safe, claims National Institute of Nutrition, a scientist, his name is Dinesh Kumar, uh, and the, paper con the, the newspaper concludes that, however, activists against these GM crops need to be convinced. So this is almost, you know, this is one of the very few reports that came up in the popular media, which is, which is in favor of BT eggplant. Now, now the, uh, I, I like to uh, give, uh, explain why I chose that particular topic. Leaf frogging is the game you and I played when we were small, okay? But in the, in, in the case of, in, uh, sociologically, the, the, the theory of development, you know, this leapfrogging is a theory of development in which developing countries skip inferior, less efficient, more expensive, or more polluting technologies and industries and move directly to more advanced one. That is what is the sociological theory, leapfrogging. And the world's, uh, one of the examples, world's first solar Howard Stadium was constructed in Taiwan in 2009, and it, no, it will generate, and generate its own electricity from photovoltaic technology designed by the Japanese architect, Toyo Ito. And you can just have a closer look. And there are other leaf rock technologies. The, most of them are in either in Pakistan, Thailand, or India, or Brazil. Solar power for rural communities in Pakistan the hospital of the future in Thailand, the world's greenest building as voted by the U.S. Green Building Council is in Hyderabad, India, free broadband and Linux machines in Brazil, barefoot solar engineers, the, that is rural women, trained to install and repair solar power systems in India. But what is the best known Indian example of leaf rogging? This one. Until some time back, the Indians could not afford to pay for the landline telephone cars. But today, even a beggar has it. Okay, so mobile phone use already exists, landline use in India, and by about, by 2007, 150 million out of the 200 million phone lines were cellular. The next leaf rock technology undoubtedly is going to be BT plan under the auspices of DBT, Government of India, USAID, ABSP2, and Cornell. Possibly this is the first edible GM crop of India. And I would like to give you some, what are all the problems? I will give you uh, some of the major, uh, in my opinion, it is all communication gap. 
So I have listed out at least three communication gaps in the um, uh, no, in in taking the technology, this technology to the dining table. So the first communication gap, all the seed industry, other than the Mahiko. Mahiko is the technology provider, right? Uh, all the seed industry, other than the Mahiko, thought it was somebody else's problem. BT Brinjal all know there are at least 71 crops that is going to be uh, in the trial phase, you know, they are going to be approved. Several industries are involved in that, but none of the industries, they wanted to support Mahiko because they thought it is Mahiko's problem. So they did not, they did not uh, support. So it appears that the rest of the seed industry has taken a decision to this effect, and Mahiko has been kept in the dark of their decision, at least officially. So this is the communication gap one. The communication gap two, Seed industry, including Mexico, conveniently did not take into confidence the public funded institutions, especially the state agricultural universities, like land grant colleges of US, state agricultural universities, the respective vice chancellors. They never accepting TNAU vice chancellor will support because it is his technology. But if you go to the next state agricultural university, if you ask that vice chancellor, he will say, Yes, BT Brinjal is, BT plant is good, but it needs more testing. So he will, he will give a kind of answer, so he doesn't want to be uh, entangled into that, into that controversy. So the company, the seed industry, either Mahiko or the rest of the industry, they did not consult or they did not uh, take, in, take the other state agricultural universities into confidence. The third communication gap is the agrarian community. No, if the industries have taken, no, if they have consulted the farmers, whether you like this or not, and they should have taken the, the technology to the farmers, convinced them first, and the farmers association would have uh, pressed the government to come out, come out with, no, there, would, there, should, there could not have been any moratorium imposed on, so the industries failed to do that. So the industry has the, uh, uh, you no, know, they, they had the industry, seed industry, taken the farmers' association into confidence. These bitter consequences of today's could have well been avoided. <coughs> so I would like to give you some idea about these are the two uh, young women. She was the entomologist who was in, uh, involved in this project, and she was the breeder. Only these two people were able to uh, evolve these to develop these varieties. So rest of the. This is Dr. Sudhakar, one of my colleagues. The, the other one is Dr. Balakrishnan, the other one is Dr. Murugan. They were also involved in that. This is the man who, was the, who gave us the original germplasm, the four germplasm. Uh, he was the dean horticulture. So this is my transgenic technology team, which I developed after I got the Rockefeller funding. I would like to quote uh, Norman in this. Elitist talk on agriculture does not help. I am particularly alarmed by those elitists who seek to deny small-scale farmers in the third world access to improved seeds, fertilizers, and crop protection chemicals that have allowed affluent nations the luxury of plentiful and, inex and inexpensive foodstuffs, uh, which in turn has accelerated their economic development. And I would also like to quote this, a layman's version. Total people killed by GMO crop is zero. Total people injured by GM crops is zero. Now compare that to the number of people who die each year from starvation. Thank you very much. Thanks.